Hello and welcome to Nigeria, the road to 2019, a series of programs where Arise News places the audience and the choice at the heart of our coverage of the upcoming presidential elections. I'm Charles Aniagolu. Coming up in the next 60 minutes, all of the group news, comment and analysis that provide unrivaled insight into Nigeria 2019, including a big night in Nigeria's electoral calendar ends in disappointment as the two men most likely to hold the future future of Nigeria in their hands failed to attend the presidential debate. We'll get to the bottom of why they were absent, even as the Buhari administration accuses the main challenger, Atiku Abubakar, fresh from a triumphant visit to the U.S., of fraudulently contributing to the collapse of one of Nigeria's major banks. Now, Saturday night was supposed to be a big night in Nigeria's electoral calendar. It was the night of the presidential debate in which the incumbent, Muhammadu Buhari, who's running for a second term, and four other challengers, including the candidate for the main opposition PDP, Atiku Abubakar, have been invited to sell themselves to voters across Nigeria. But the two main candidates, the two people seen as the front runners, didn't turn up. So the debate proceeded with Obi Ezekwesili of the Allied Congress Party of Nigeria, Fela Duratoye of the Alliance of New Nigeria, and Kingsley Maalu of the Young Progressive Party. Meanwhile, the government turned the vitriol on Atiku Abubakar while he was on a high-level visit to the United States. The Information Minister, Lai Mohammed, accused Mr. Atiku of involvement in the collapse of Bank PHB and of benefiting from a slush fund in 2009 to the tune of 156 million naira warning that Mr. Atiku would have questions to answer about how this contributed to the failure of the bank. Well, in a moment, we'll have reaction to all this from Mr. Atiku's spokesman and head of his media office, Paul Ebay. But first, should Mr. Atiku be worried about Mr. Mohammed's pronouncements regarding the collapse of Bank PHB? Could the government take action against Mr. Atiku by ordering his arrest and detention? Well, for more on this, let's cross over now to our Lagos studios and speak to the managing director of Arise TV Africa and former editor and group executive director of this day newspaper, Ijoma Ngogugu, who for many years was the paper's highly respected group business editor. And uh, good to talk with you, uh, Ijoma. First of all, set the stage uh, for us. Uh, what are the origins of bank PHB and how is it linked to Atiku Abubakar? Because I understand that it came into existence after the merger of Platinum Bank and Habib Bank, one of which had Mr. Atiku as a shareholder. Um, yes, yes, I will tell you now. Um, um, a bank PHB came about uh, from the merger in 2005-2006 between Habib Bank, in the form Habib Bank of Nigeria, and Platinum Bank. Um, Habib Bank, if you look at the origin, Habib Bank was, uh, uh, like a, a subsidiary of Habib Bank of Pakistan. Habib Bank of, of Pakistan, which is the biggest bank in Pakistan. So when it set up shop in 1981, or 87, I think, in Nigeria, um, the family of uh, the late uh, Major General uh, Shehu Yaradua uh, were shareholders, and it is believed that uh, Asiko Abubaka, the former vice president Asiko Abubaka, who was also in their partner, both political and business partner, must have had some shares in the Habib Bank. And in any case, when the banking consolidation took place, in um, 2005 2006, 
um, have these banks and similar um, platinum banks merged to form what later became Transit. Now, uh, I just have to um, uh, alert our, our, our viewers, uh, Ijoma, that there's, your, your sound is not uh, very, it's not brilliantly audible. So if, if, the pe if our people in, in Lagos could fiddle a bit with it in, in the gallery, and perhaps we could achieve better sound. We can hear you, though, so nothing to worry about there. Now, the government of President Buhari is saying that Mr. Atiku contributed to the collapse of Bank PHB in 2009 and that his company took what amounts to an overdraft of 156 million naira. What I don't understand is how could the taking of an overdraft of 156 million naira lead to the collapse of a bank with a share capital of 225 billion naira? I don't know if the function by PHP has a share capital of um, 225 billion naira. But what I know, know is that it has a minimum capital requirement, share capital requirement of 25 billion naira. So even if it had exceeded that through capital, even if it had exceeded that through capital, in the region of 225 billion naira, and the time of its collapse. But we need to say about one thing: uh, at the time of its um, collapse. Um, the vice president has stepped down from office. He was no longer the former vice president, so no longer the vice president of the other And if you recall, um, Bank PHP was one of six to eight banks that failed the stress test on the taken by the Central Bank of Nigeria. Bank. And um, the reasons that were blamed for the failure of all the banks were. It is all of you know, reasons ranging from margin lending and inside and from margin lending, inside lending, for corporate governance structures and its general mismanagement. And so by the time the Central Bank of Nigeria came in to do a stress test, because this, stress, this period also coincided with the global financial crisis that was affecting a lot of uh, even Nigerian banks, the contagion effects to the sector to be felt among Nigerian banks. And by the time they undertook the stress test, a lot of a lot of these banks had uh, uh, capital adequacy nature and eroded before the world you know, regulatory requirements. And so I don't know how the federal government today has come to the conclusion the federal government today has come to the conclusion that um, uh, the former vice president took a, sl uh, a loan or an overdraft, an overdraft is a short-term loan, took how a short-term loan of 156 million naira could have led to the collapse of the bank. If you recall what the Minister of Information said last week Friday when he had a press conference on this issue, he first referred to a slush fund. Um, so there has to be clarity, first and foremost, from the Information Minister as to whether there was a slush fund that bank PHB or its management set up for the purpose of diverting or paying certain individuals in or outside government. Um, so they refer to a slush run on the one hand, and on the other hand, they refer to an overdraft. If it's a slush run, that's another kettle of fish altogether. But if on the other hand, they said, Atuko Abubakar's company benefited to the tune of 156 million naira by way of overdraft, um, I don't see how that constitutes a criminal offense in any shape or form. I've always, I've always said, and I wrote about it um, repeatedly, I recall in, 2000, in 2009, a series of articles that we cannot criminalize bad debtors. So even if Atiku Abubakar took an overdraft of 156 million naira, at the time, and he has not repaid it to debt, it is the responsibility of the bank, which is no longer is in existence, but it does have a successor company, which is Keystone Bank, to take Atiku Abubakar to court and recover its funds, recover its uh, money from the former vice president. 
that's a very interesting, and, and um, I'm sure a lot of people really had no idea about these things. So, so it's, it's quite good that you're explaining it to us um, as clearly and as lucidly uh, as you are. And of course, your sound has improved considerably now, so we're hearing you a lot better. Uh, the other question, uh, Ijoma, is, is how is it that these people are able to gain access to citizens' bank accounts i mean we have to you know the, the case for instance of an ngo talking about the accounts of the chief justice mm -hmm. of nigeria and now we've got the minister of information talking about atiku abubakar's accounts i mean does that not contravene and pardon my ignorance but does that not contravene banking regulations which say that no bank can uh, divulge details of of somebody's bank account without the order of a court Certainly, um, Charles. Um, I'd like to um, put a proper perspective on this. If you recall, in June or is it July last year, uh, President Mohamed Buhari issued executive, the Presidential Executive Order 6, which permits um, the law enforcement agencies to, to seize or freeze the assets of individuals, even where the, these assets are found in bank accounts, like in the case of monies found in bank accounts. However, some lawyers went to court challenging, saying, saying it, challenging the executive or saying it was in contravention, in, in contravention of the Nigerian constitution. Um, the court in October validated the executive order of the president. However, it, it, was, it made it very clear that the law enforcement agencies cannot on their own order for the freezing of any individual or company's account without the order of the court. In the same vein, this can be applicable to the disclosure of people's or customers' bank information. If our individual or if my account details are disclosed by my bank today, to any person, a third party without my permission and without the order of the court, I will definitely sue the living daylights of my bank. However, we must, we must be clear, there are four instances where a bank may be compelled to divulge the information of its customers. One, the first instance is where the law requires it to do so. Uh, take for instance, when there's a court case uh, when the court, like I said, if the court orders the, uh, the, the, the bank to disclose the account details of its customers. Also, um, in instances where the Federal Inland Revenue Service has to have access to your account details in order to determine whether you're paying the right taxes or not. In some instances where a company is also being liquidated, the account uh, details of of a customer, in this case a corporate body, might have to be disclosed to, account, uh, to, to, the, to the Corporate Affairs Commission. Uh, also, in instances where there are spurious transactions um, that are going through an account, uh, the Anti-Money Laundering Act requires banks to disclose those details to either the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission or the Nigeria Financial Intelligence Unit. Uh, another instance where a bank may disclose a customer's details uh, relates to when it is in the interest of the bank to do so. Uh, this pertains to when um, when the, a bank uh, when the bank takes a customer to court because he, be he has become a bad debtor. So he, um, he might have to reveal the the details of the customer to the court. Also, when it's also in the public interest, uh, a bank can disclose uh, a customer's details to the law enforcement authorities when, he's, he, when the bank suspects that the monies passing through her account are being used for terrorism activities. And of course, the final uh, instance when a bank can disclose details is when the customer gives the bank the permission to do so.
Okay, I have to say that is hugely enlightening. Ijoma, thank you very much indeed. Ijoma Wogugwe is, of course, uh, the managing director of Arise TV Africa and former editor and group executive director of This Day newspaper, who for many years was the paper's highly respected group business editor. Thank you very much indeed. And you're watching Nigeria 2019. And as you know, Mr. Atiku returned from the United States at the weekend, fresh from a high-level trip to the United States, a country that the ruling APC party had said he would not be allowed to enter. But of course, as you heard there, while he was away, the government laid another charge on him relating to the collapse of Bank PHB. And on his return, he drew angry reactions from many Nigerians for failing to attend a hugely anticipated presidential debate. Well, to help us understand what is going on from the perspective of Atiku Abubakar himself, I'm joined now in the studio by Mr. Atiku's spokesman and head of his media office, uh, Mr. Paul Ebay. Thank you very much indeed for coming in. It's my pleasure. And for sitting there patiently and listening to us um, set the stage for all this. Now, the government, as you heard there, has challenged uh, Mr. Atiku to explain his involvement in the alleged slush funds or overdraft or whatever that led to the collapse of Bank PHB. What is Mr. Atiku's response to that? Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. His Excellency Atiku Abubaka is waiting, you know, for the government or whatever agency of government is responsible for this to, you know, present him with, uh, you know, the posers the questions that he needs to provide answers to. And until that is done, he will not you know, readily have an, you know, There must be, a, what we had was over the media, and, and I want to believe that uh, that's not how governance you know, investigation is conducted. So there must be a, a process of communicating uh, you know, that to you know, Atiku Abubakar, and he's waiting for that. So what do you think was behind uh, Mr. Mohammed, the information minister, going on television rather than following a process of, a, of, a, you know, of, a, of an enforcement agency, the police or an investigative body or something, you know, serving Mr. Atiku with notice and expecting him to respond to whatever notice they've served on him? Well, we are still trying to, you know, have a sense of, how the information minister and culture minister will, uh, you know, be all rolled in one, the, you know, the police, the AFCC, the judiciary, and all of that. But all of, all of that nonsense is all politics. Uh, the, the APC government wanted to change the narratives. Uh, they didn't want Nigerians talking about Atiku's visit to the U.S. and the benefits that will accrue, you know, from that visit. That was why they, you know, did what they did a needless distraction. Right. Yes, because the, the question I'd ask is, when did they discover this? Was it after he had traveled to the U.S. or before he had traveled? And I mean, Nigerians need to understand. Mm. I think uh, we will obviously talk about that trip um, to the U.S. and uh, we'll have a chance to discuss the ramifications of it. But nevertheless, the government has said that Mr. Atiku must explain his role and has a case to answer. Do, do, do you fear that the government might take some sort of action against Mr. Atiku? We are aware, and uh, the statement by His Excellency President Olushago Basanja confirms the information that we have that there are plans by this government as part of, you know, their strategy for 2019, taking into cognizance the fact that, you know, they've largely run a failed government that has enthroned poverty, hopelessness, 21 million people are unemployed, 19 million in, in the extreme poverty, you know, trap. Uh, the killings are continuing unabated. They know they are going to fail in the election. So what have they done? They have designed you know, a number of things, and that includes the arrest of top leaders of the opposition. That also included with what is happening to the justice uh, minister. You mean the chief justice? That's right, the chief justice of Nigeria. Before then, we had, you know, the attempts to, you know, to force out the Amnesty International and UNICEF, uh, which was uh, rather silly of them, you know, considering the huge role these agencies, uh, you know, play, you know, in our lives. So, 
And of course, they clam down on the media. So the next stage of it is the, you know, is the arrest of a top uh, you know, opposition uh, leaders like Atiku Abubakar. That information is at our disposal. We have that. Well, the point, of course, is that whether it, there is a political motivation, a sleight of hand taking place here. I mean, in the case of the Chief Justice, for example, I mean, you know, you, you would have thought, although he's obviously innocent until proven guilty, but I mean, you would have thought that he would be aware as the Chief Justice of, of Nigeria, head of the judiciary, <laughs> that, I mean, you've got to, you know, you have to file your asset, you give your asset declaration and be honest in, in your declaration of assets. And, and again, I'm not implying that he wasn't, but I'm saying that the charges being laid against him seem to suggest that he was erroneous or forgetful or something in his filing of that application. I wouldn't speak for the you know, Chief Justice, I don't have, you know, response. I don't have the mandate. To yeah, but what I'm him. saying is that it gives ammunition, even if there is a political motivation. There has to be something there for what there is it, to be what, political what is in, what is important, for somebody to take advantage what of. What is it. important is that there has to be a process. Even if the allegations that are made, there has to be a due mm. process. You must follow the due process. And that's what we're saying. The due process has not been followed. They just want to, you know, uh, you know, ramrod, have their way, you know. They, they, the strategy is to is to have a change of guard at the you know at the top you know level you know of, of the judiciary and because of the fact they fear that the elections will probably you know get up to the you know the, you know the supreme court so they want somebody pliable well that's purely speculative of course well it is the character of this administration and we've seen it play out over and over again well we've, let's we've seen it with uh, the case of uh, you know, the INEC, uh, you know, uh, you know, you know, you know, you know, bro, we, we, we've seen that in a number of instances. Right. But let, let's get back to your candidate, Atiku Abubakar. Are you quite clear in your mind that Mr. Atiku had nothing to do with the alleged, alleged issues that led to the collapse of Bank PHB and that there is no evidence that you're, you are aware of that could link him to that? I can tell you for free that it's all politics. There is nothing to it, nothing to the allegations. I can say, you know, here, that indeed, His Excellency Atuku Abubakar actually lost billions of money in the collapse of Bank PHB. About three billion, or thereabout. Didn't benefit from any slush funds. Didn't benefit from what he has, you know, speculating that he, you know, he did. And he is waiting for them to come and lay their allegations and he, he, will, he will respond well i mean if what you're saying is accurate clearly three billion naira is a far cry from 156 oh, yes. million naira but so so you say that mr atiku has no skeletons of any sort in his cupboard your opponents the apc and the buhari administration say he doesn't just have skeletons he's got an entire cemetery in his cupboard which do we believe as the nigerian people well, we have to believe about the cemetery that has become the APC, you know, administration led by, uh, you know, you know, President Muhammad Buhari. I mean, we are all living witnesses to the Baba Chalawal case. I mean, we've seen the NMPC, we've seen, uh, you know, seven instances of corruption, what is playing out in Kano State, and in all of all, all the allegations. And the, just recently, uh, in one of their campaigns, in a, you know, you know, in Wari, I believe, you know, the. The chairman of the party did say, and I quote, that once you cross over to the APC, your sins are claimed. Are well, in fairness to them, they did come out, the vice president just, just come out to say that Baba Chia Lawal will be prosecuted. Well, that's an afterthought. And that is also political. Yeah, but that may be due to what you are asking how for, long, which is, which how is long, due how, process. How long I mean, has it the, taken? The process of the law takes a long the time. Baba Inst case started last year. There was a Senate committee. There was even a presidential mm. committee that was set up. And indicted, uh, it was headed by, uh, you know, I think the vice president. And in he was indicted. So one would think that the next thing to do is to charge him to court. But that didn't happen. But all of a sudden, they wake up, you know, one day and they file, you know, charges against the Chief Justice of Nigeria. Pronto. It shows clearly that 
you know, the, 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 the anti-corruption war is actually a war against the opposition. Of course, the bank PHB issue came to the fore whilst Mr. Atiku was in the United States on a trip that the government had tried and failed to stop. Why was it necessary for Mr. Atiku to visit the United States and to make such a big deal out of the trip? Well, I took Abu Bakr, I did say, over and over again, that he applied for a visa. I mean, it was this government that made it an issue. It was never going to be an issue. A private citizen traveling all over the country, you know, you, know, you know, wherever he wants to go. He's been everywhere. Well, in fairness to this government, it started long before they came into, into office. I mean, yes, it, it, started, well, it started with Mr. Atiku's principal. Or Bassinger himself. He was the one who, who brought the, all this to the, to the no, floor. No, but he didn't say. This administration did say, and the, the spokesperson of the APC campaign did say that there was an, a sealed indictment waiting for Atiku Abubakar in the United States. Yeah, but even Bassinger himself, he kept saying, no, well, let him try and go to the United no, we're States. We're talking about what is recent. The most recent was what was said by Festus Kiyamu. And I mean, we, we, we saw the indictment unsealed when Atiku Abubakar traveled to the U.S. with the meetings that he had with members of the Congress, with the meetings that he had with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, with the meetings he had with uh, the State Department, the U.S. Institute of Peace, with the business community, with Nigerians and diaspora. Maybe that was the sealed indictment that he spoke to. Yeah, but did your heart do a little bit of a flip-flop when he was walking through immigration in America? Did no, you, for no. one minute, think, oh dear, you know? I, you know, I, I was never under any doubt about the fact that there was nothing. Because, I mean, I mean I, I've worked with him for about 10 years, mm. and I, there was nothing. I mean, we spoke in private, and he did assure me, for the mm. purpose of the job that I do, there was nothing against him. It was purely administrative. And when that time came to, you know, to deal with that issue, it was dealt with. And then he traveled. And uh, they were taken by surprise. And they wanted to, you know, uh, to douse, you know, the euphoria, the, you know, the benefits of you know, that particular visit. And they came up with uh, the bank PhD. Right. And, and, and talking about benefits, having now succeeded in defying predictions of his arrest and successfully visiting the United States, what did that visit achieve? A lot. You see, when you're going to be the president of a country, especially a, you know, a country as important as Nigeria, you need to be prepared. You need to have the network. You know, let me give you a background to the visit of Atiku to the U.S. Before he left, unemployment was 23.1 percent, 90 million people in extreme poverty, 4 million jobs were lost last year, more people are being killed every day, Nigeria is more divided than we have ever been since the Civil War. That was the background. And people are diverse in Procter Gamble, a number of companies, GE have left, pulled off their 2.5 billion you know, dollar investment they're about to make. Atiku went there and met with them. He's been, from, he's been a vice president, and they know he's president. They know that he's a Democrat. They know that he's a business person. They know that he understands the essence of bringing investments, investment that will bring jobs, jobs that will create opportunities and lead people out of poverty. They know that. They're also looking for where they'll put their money into. And so that accounted for the meetings that he had mm. under the framework of his jobs, jobs, opportunity being united and security. He met with the State Department. You know, to assure them of, 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 uh, of, 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 you know, of, of the friendship of Nigeria when he becomes president, even if you are looking for new friends, never forget old friendship and old alliances. That was what he tried to do, to reinforce, you know, that friendship with America. He also tried to meet with the investors and to tell them that Nigeria is open for business and your businesses will be protected, you know, under the law of Nigeria, you know, when I become a president. He also met with Nigerians in diaspora and to give them an insight into his plan, you know, to get Nigeria working again. He did all of that. And uh, at the end of the day, they are left uh, flat-footed. What was their response? Bank PHB. Don't forget, the same bank PHB is Keystone Bank. And you know, you only need to use your teeth to count your tongue to know why they are doing what they are doing. And uh, are America's policy makers and policy influencers now inclining towards Atiku and less towards Mr. Buhari as a result of Mr. Atiku's visit to Washington, or is that difficult to predict? America, 
will align with a Democrat. America will align with somebody with a passion for investment. America is dependent. I mean, as big as the, the economy of America is dependent on you know, investment and giving opportunities to people. And uh, if America is able to make, and the leadership of the, you know, of the United States is able to make that determination, I mean, it's very clear where the pendulum will swing. Of course, it will sing, swing to, Mr. You know, to Atiku Abubakar. Well, you would say that, wouldn't you? Well, his, his, uh, I mean, his, his antecedents, you know, speak you know, you know, for him. He's a business person. I mean, he's a Democrat. He has put his life on the line. He's done far much more than many more, you know, people, than any other people in this administration, you know, for democracy. Well, it's interesting that you say all that. He, he was riding this sort of wave of um, success as he went to America and returned to Nigeria and, and then turned up for a presidential debate and left. I mean, you know, that happened on Saturday. Uh, Mr. Atiku pulled out at, at the last minute after, after he had already turned up and was, I understand, waiting to be announced onto the stage. I mean, why did he leave the venue? The party, when I mean the party, the PDP, had an understanding with the organizers of the debate. And they were very clear about it. And they gave a condition for Atiku to be at the debate. The incumbent must be at the debate. This election is a referendum on Mohamed Buhari and his failed policies. He has to be there. Atiku cannot be debating in isolation. The president, who is the incumbent, needs to be there to be able to have a debate. But of course, we've seen that he didn't have anything to offer. He had nothing to offer. Well, in, in, in fairness to, 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 to the presidency and, and the, the APC lot, the, the point is that, first of all, I mean, just talking about the fact that Mr. Atiku essentially walked out, um, there were three other presidential candidates who were present. I mean, to assume that the only person worthy of engaging in a debate is the incumbent president, and that really it was between he and Atiku comes across as the height of spectacular arrogance, and many people felt, I mean, insulted by it. Atiku Abouaka did apologize to both you know, his co-debaters, the three of them, did apologize to the moderator and to Nigerians. You know, the, what is important is that Buhari, as president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, needed to be at that debate. Yeah, but, but why? It was a principled position that he I, I understand yes. that. I understand that. Yes. But, but Mr. Atiku would have garnered considerable moral high ground for himself if he had, because what the way it looked was that it was a slight on Nigerians who were waiting to hear from him. He didn't think the Nigerians were important enough for him to, because, I mean, look, <laughs> Mr. Atiku has a plan for Nigeria, and, and so do the three other candidates. Nigerians wanted to hear that plan and were denied the opportunity to do so. To that extent, you lost the moral high ground you could have retained by showing off your candidate as being respectful of the Nigerian people and coming as a servant of the people to present his credentials to the people he's hoping to serve. Do, do you understand that? Perhaps, perhaps I need to stress that he took a principled position. There was an understanding between the organizers of the debate and the PDP, Presidential Council. And that was one condition they gave, that uh, uh, President Mohamed Buhari needed to be at that debate. However, Atiku still has other opportunities. I mean, he's been engaging you know, with Nigerians you know, across the length and breadth. Last so week, Wednesday, he was in Lagos you know, to engage with the business community as we speak. He's in, to he's in, uh, he's in Taraba. So basically, he, he was looking down on the other three, no, he three wasn't. candidates. That wasn't they, the they simply weren't good that enough. That wasn't the issue. That wasn't the issue. He was trying to abide by the understanding that the, the, his party had with the organizers of the debate that President Mohamed Buhari needed to be available for that debate. It, look, if you are going for a job interview, you don't go there and say, you know, or, or, you know the, the other main applicant for the job didn't turn up and, and therefore I'm leaving. 
Mr. Atiku is applying for a job. The Nigerians are the employers. You turn up there. You don't come in and say, oh, the other guy didn't turn up and therefore I leave. You take advantage of their absence to present your qualifications and plans about how you are going to execute the job. So in, in many ways, it's actually an advantage for you and suggests a lack of proper judgment on Mr. Atiku's part, on the part of his deputies and his advisors, such as yourself. Like I said, there are other opportunities. Mr. Atiku Abubakar has been engaged with critical stakeholders. He's done that with the women, he's done that with the youth, he's done that with the business community. He continues to engage with them, you know, to give them an insight into why, you know, his plans to get Nigeria to work again. I mean, we've seen the last four years of this administration has been a failed one in every ramification. This country has never been this divided. I mean, if we don't have a country, if we are not united around shared value, as Atuka Abaka is trying to bring, somebody who truly embodies, you know, the, you know, the essence of what the Nigerian that we all aspire to be, a detribalized person, somebody who, you know, who, you know, who, you know, who, you know, who is very good at bringing people, you know, around the table to have a discussion and have a resolution on those issues, somebody who has a knack for bringing talent to putting people together. That's what we'll be talking about, you know, going forward, you know, in this country. Not a, not a bigot, not, an, you know, you know, not, 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 not somebody that, uh, you know, denies people, you know, opportunities and speak to 97% versus 5%. That's not the kind of president that we're looking for. Nigeria is an, an emergency situation. And we need somebody who is fit, who is strong, who is able, who has a competence, who has the business acumen, who will see, you know, running governance as a business, who will deliver dividends. You know, to shareholders, Nigerians, and profit to investors who are coming, who will create an enabling environment for people to, you know, to have opportunity, you know, give education. Because make no mistake about it, the future belongs to the young people, and that future is education. And after 16 years of a PDP government and three and a half years of an APC government, the PDP suddenly woke up and realized that Nigeria needs education, that the youth who've been ignored for decades suddenly need to, to have attention paid to them. Mr. Atiku was vice president of this country for eight years. He presided over, to some extent, the economy of this country and so many of the aspects of this country. And yet this country voted the PDP out in 2015. And now you're telling us after three and a half years that you've got a magic wand from Harry Potter or whoever it is you've got it from, and you're going to walk in, wave that magic wand, and all Nigeria's problems are going to disappear. When he was the vice president, 19... 1997, I recall he hosted a summit, you know, with governors of the north. And it, there was one subject in that summit. It was education, you know, and how they can be able to give, uh, you, know, uh, you know, education to, you know, to, you know, to, the, you know, to the people as a way of, uh, you know, minimizing, uh, you know, the itinerant, uh, you know, young men and women all over the place. You know, that did it. It was a responsibility, you know, you know, of those governors to take it to the next level. Let's also make, you know, re recall what, you know, what he did under his watch as vice president. As chairman of the, you know, of, uh, you know, as the head of the economic, uh, you know, team of the president, we saw growth at about seven percent. We saw jobs being created. We saw diversification of the economy. You know, we, the, the 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 GSM uh, telecommunication uh, revolution that we have seen in this country were things that you know that happened under his watch. And still, the Nigerians voted your, you, the, the PDP out. But never mind that. Let, let's move forward because we're almost out of time. What would Mr. Atiku? do? What would be the first thing, what would he consider his overriding priority if he got elected as president? What would be the first thing that he would do getting into office? I think it's more like I said earlier. If there is no unity, there can be stability. Yeah, but you don't suddenly unite a country can, overnight. You, no, I, I'm saying practically, what's practically, the first no, thing but, that but he would that do? You have to give people a sense of, you have to run and inclusive. The first indication of that would be in his government. Right. How inclusive is it? And that will give people a sense of belonging. I say, yes, this is a guy that we'll do business with. Okay, I have to say, Mr. Paul Ibe, it's been a pleasure talking with you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Paul Ibe is, of course, Mr. Achiku's spokesman and head of his media office.
You're watching Nigeria, the road to 2019. Plenty more still ahead, including we'll hear from a top analyst, the Director General of the People's Democratic Institute, who will uh, put all we've heard so far in objective perspective. We'll also get his assessment of who outgunned whom at this weekend's presidential debate. Stay with us. <laughs> 